Okay, so hello, I'm Jesse Gordon, chairman of the Randolph Democratic Town Committee. I'm joined by Jared Rose, uh, candidate for state senate. Uh, uh, and I'll let other people introduce themselves, but our co-host is Kathy Tuffy, the chair of the Braintree Dems. Uh, and then uh, other people can introduce themselves when they ask a question. We've got a few people and um, we'll be recording this uh, starting now for uh, posting on the internet so that we hope lots of people can see it, we'll post it everywhere possible. Uh, Kathy, you wanna introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Kathy Tuffy, Chair of Braintree Democratic Town Committee. Um, Jared is running um, for State Senate and his district, uh, Norfolk, Bristol, and Plymouth, includes two uh, precincts in Braintree, District 1 and District 2 of Braintree. So welcome, Jared, and uh, I think that we're all set for Jared to begin and talk about his candidacy and then ask questions. Sure, so Jared, why don't you do an introduction? Um, I do have a, uh, a comment from Senator Timothy, uh, who is not going to attend, but sent a, a statement to read, just a brief statement, but you can do your introduction first. Okay. Uh, thank you everyone for having me. My name is Jared Rose. I'm talking to you from Stoughton. Uh, where I live with um, and own my house with my wife and my 12-day-old son, no, 15-day-old son. <laughs> um, and uh, so if you hear weird noises going on, it's probably the baby <laughs> in the background. Um, and I'm running for state senate. You know, a little bit about me. I grew up here in Mass, uh, went to all public schools, uh, went to UMass Amherst to get my degree. I actually am a former progressive state senate aide, uh, where I worked on uh -huh. things like housing policy, transportation, environment, uh, criminal justice reform, so much more. I left the state senate as an aide to uh, go into real estate and help my family's private um, private small business. And the You know, we really have grown that company from a three-person uh, operation to a 26-person operation over the last couple of years. And I left the building in the, the Beacon Hill with no real intention of running for office. Uh, uh, you know, I joined town meeting here in Stoughton um, on the Cultural Council and the Historical Commission, uh, Democratic Town Committee, and I thought, you know, just being involved locally was going to be fine. Uh, and then a couple of key moments happened for me that really kind of got me into thinking about this race and really kind of pushing this envelope, right? Uh, the first was, you know, in, in September of 2018, when I called uh, State Senator Walter Timothy, who was my opponent, um, I called his office just to find out where he was on the three ballot questions that year, particularly focused on question three, which you might remember was the transgender quote unquote bathroom bill. And I had done a lot of work on trying to pass that original piece of legislation that the ballot question was trying to overturn. So I was really, con you know, wanted to know where my state legislator stood. And I called multiple times and got multiple refusals to answer the question. And then fast forward to March of 2019 when our state senator was literally the only Democrat who voted with the Trump administration to keep cuts to Title X in place, which is uh, sexual health services, family planning, cancer screenings, wellness services, so much more. And about 70,000 women rely on that almost exclusively in the state to, uh, for most of their healthcare services. So these type of values were not okay with me. And as I kind of got more into this race, I decided that we have a real opportunity in this district to really kind of be a progressive leader and have a progressive leader in the South Shore and really kind of make this area a much more uh, active po political scene. Uh, so we're running and we're uh, putting everything into it and uh, look forward to answering any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Let me read the statement that Senator Timothy sent in. Uh, please accept my thanks for the RDTC, that's the Randolph Dems, for inviting me to participate in the Zoom meet and greet. Although my Senate duties prevent me from being with you, please know that as a fellow Democrat, I stand with you in your work for the party. I respectfully ask for your vote on September 1st or earlier so that I may continue 
to work for you in the state Senate. All the best, Walter. Okay, I'll open the floor to questions. Kathy, did you want to start? Uh, well, I notice that Jared, you ha are a um, endorsed by Moms Demand Action, which is a very um, important group to me. I feel that um, although Massachusetts has uh, good laws on the books, uh, we still can do more here. Can you um, describe your position on um, making sure our schools and our, our public places and everyday people are safe um, from uh, misuse of uh, weapons? Right. So yes, so I was uh, certified as a Moms Demand Action candidate. Uh, which I was really pleased to get their backing. And um, for those unfamiliar watching this later, Moms Demand Action is a nationwide group that um, that really tries to promote common sense gun control reform. And like you said, Kathy, you know Massachusetts is probably nationwide has some of the strongest gun laws in the in the country. And but one of our key things, right? is we kind of have two major problems. One is illegal weapons coming from out of state, right? Uh, particularly New Hampshire, Pennsylvania, Virginia, um, some of, sometimes from Vermont. Um, and so trying to control that flow on ha and trying to prevent those illegal weapons from coming over. And then two, one of our biggest problems is access to firearms with other social issues. And what I mean by that is things like suicide, domestic violence, uh, these types of things tend to be huge escalators in these types of um, social uh, situations. So one of the best things we can do is try to be advocates and try to convince our other states to try to adopt some of our really strict laws that in and of itself will help control supply so that we don't have some of these illegal guns going on. Two, some of it is a an access to care problem, right, where if we can get people who are in a domestic violence situation or who have suicidal tendencies um, the care that they need ahead of time, then we won't have these types of um, personal violences, right? And, and so I'm not talking about mass shootings or school shootings or anything like that. These are the more quiet types of personal violence that happens. Uh, and being so. I think if you kind of come at it from a where is the gun, where are the guns coming from and how are they being used perspective, I think that that is some of our most effective uh, roads. And then, you know, one thing that I'm really interested in is trying to figure out ways to try to go after some of the manufacturers, right, for uh, liability, for that type of insurance um, liability control. Uh, you know, if if we, if we treated guns like we treated cars, right, where you had to actually get a license and you had to get a registration and you had to get training and you had to have an insurance, um, you still have the right to have a car and most people do, um, but you have to do it safely. So that type of um, policy agenda is kind of where I'm coming at from with this issue. Thank you very much. Are there other questions for, for Jared? Uh, yeah, so folks can raise their hands if they'd like to ask a question. And uh, I will keep an eye out for that. I think that's Toby saying yes. Uh, Toby, you're I'm muted. Sorry. I think you're muted. Yeah, I, I've unmuted you. You look good. Go ahead. What are your views on the transfer station in Holbrook? That we're trying to uh, eliminate from our lives, but not oh, you mean the compressor yet? station? 
That's yeah. not the Weymouth compressor station. That's the trash transfer station. Oh, the trash transfer Holbrook, station. Although there are two different issues. Yes, yes, they do. Right, right. Uh, not a fan of either one. Let me put it that way. Um, I think, you know, I think one of these things is is one of the reasons that like environmental justice is really important for for instituting in a lot of our policies going forward, right? It's not a surprise to anyone that Randolph, with the largest minority population in the district and in the neighboring communities, has a lot of these targeted things either in it or on its border, right? Um, so if we can, you know, really try to pass some environmental justice aspects so that, the, so that local communities have more control over harmful procedures, right? And, and, you know, when it comes to like the Weymouth compressor station end of it, uh, which I know you didn't ask about, but, you know, in and of itself is, we don't really need these fossil fuels uh, and, the, and the infrastructure for them just so that the natural gas companies can export their gas to Europe, right? Um, and we shouldn't be putting our, our citizens and constituents at risk with it. Thank you. Uh, let me ask a question that came up during the state rep meet and greet regarding the uh, bus line uh, in Randolph. That's the 240 line, which is our lifeline, but throughout the district, there are several other bus lines. Um, and I think there's really two parts. One is protecting the existing bus lines and the other is expanding to new bus lines, which I think would include Stoughton. I think your, your home is Stoughton and there's no bus line there? There's a bus line in Stoughton, uh, but it's not extensive. Mm -hmm. So what's your view on uh, protecting the existing lines? I always hear that the 240 is at risk. Um, the uh, other candidates who asked about this pointed out that, you know, things are really in a mess because of the pandemic. And I certainly haven't ridden the bus since the pandemic started. I used to ride yeah. every day. Um, and assuming that we get past that and everything survives, what, what do you do to protect it and expand it, including cross-line uh, buses, which I've heard about for a long time to, to go from, for example, the Randolph Holbrook uh, train station to the Stoughton train station and others like that? Yeah. Well, so for me, it, it's a cross issue between some of my platform things on our environment, right, and our transportation system. Um, so one thing that I'm really pushing, and I'll get to the main point in a second, is for 100% renewable energy, right? And one of the reasons for that is that if we can get to 100% renewable energy, we can then effectively electrify our bus systems and our MBTA and commuter rail system, right? That in and of itself saves the, the government massive amounts of money just on gas and diesel costs, right? Um, so what I would like to see is a real expansion of, our, of the bus system in Randolph, in Brockton, in Stoughton, um, in Braintree, in Milton, and so on. Um, each of these towns have uh, some access to a bus system right now. Um, but oftentimes, it is pretty slow. <laughs> um, and as a, as a background story, when I left college, I got this job um, making 10 bucks an hour. Uh, and I moved into an apartment with a couple friends in Brookline. Um, and my job was in Milton Center. And I did not have a car. So it took me two trains and a bus to get from Braintree to, Mil uh, from Brookline to Milton Center, uh, or roughly about an hour and 45 minutes each way. Um, that type of, you know, Delay is what causes people to buy cars. And if we can build a real public transportation system that makes it unnecessary for people to own cars, people can make that choice, right? It's a very expensive to own a car, but it is not, um, like here in Stoughton, 
it's not a viable option not to have one, right? And most of Randolph, it's not a viable option. Um, so really trying to figure out a way to expand that. And, you know, we can kind of go more into like how the government gets its money so that we can fund it. Um, but I think that that plus, you know, real commuter rail expansion um, and changing how that agency works, I think is really crucial for our, our transportation system in this district. Thank you. Um, I'm opening up to other questions. A couple people just, I just admitted a couple more people from the waiting room. Uh, open to questions, otherwise I'll ask the next question. Kathy? Toby? Chris? I, I don't see anyone uh, there. I did have a question about housing and housing insecurity especially, is especially uh, bad now with the people losing their jobs. Um, uh, what could you do on as a state senator to alleviate some of that housing security that is so prevalent with the uh, pandemic and unemployment? Well, so I think one of the, one of the things that, that the legislature did, which is good, but didn't go far enough, what, during this pandemic was they put up, you know, the eviction stoppage, uh, eviction moratorium. Um, and that's a great start. But especially in this district and most suburban districts out there, you know, we do have renters, but they're not a huge chunk of homeowners, of, of owners. Most people own their home. Uh, so you also need a, a stabilizing force in the mortgage system as well, or you're, or you're going to have a huge foreclosure crisis. So right now, I believe that there's a, there's a conflict actually legally going on right now between some lawyers in the state and the federal government as to which branch has the authority to actually do something like this. But um, being able to put some type of mortgage freeze on some of these payments would really kind of help alleviate some of our, our crisis issues for housing. And, and that is really, you know, that is on top of your thousand other problems that have, that existed before the pandemic to begin with, right? Like, if there's anything that the pandemic has shown is that our social safety net was really weak and our system was really fractured to begin with. And, and we have a huge ability to let people slip through the cracks. So, Long term for housing, what you really need is having people in office who can kind of build out a more comprehensive housing plan for the entire region, right? Because what we really allowed to happen is that each town and municipality has created their own plan, their own zoning laws. But very rarely do people actually move like that, right? Very rarely do people build like that they tend to move much more regionally and build much more regionally. So having some type of plan while still having the local, local governments really have some say, I think makes a lot more sense for the next 50 to 100 years, right? And gives you much greater housing population, uh, housing base. Um, but in the short term, we need to figure out, we need to do some type of mortgage freeze on top of the rental freeze. So because, well, just because like, if you think about it, most rent, most tenant buildings, right? Most three families that rent, they're not owned by a corporation, they're owned by a single person. And that person requires their month, their payment in order to make their mortgage payment, right? And if that's not coming in, you will have a foreclosure pretty quickly. Um, that's just pretty simple math. So having that uh, stoppage, at least on a temporary basis, will allow people to, you know, get their money back um, and not and not have a foreclosure crisis in the system. And long term, it's better for everybody, um, not just the individual people affected. So let me follow up on that. I believe that uh, 
in, in Randolph, we passed an eviction and foreclosure uh, resolution. In other words, saying you, you can't uh, because we anticipated that the state law would expire, which I believe it did earlier this month. I'm not too sure of the status on that with regards to foreclosure and or eviction and uh, what what would you do uh, on, on that front to extend it if it's expired or what is its status and what can you do? The, my understanding is that the gov that the law gives the governor the authority to continuously extend it as necessary and he has done so until I want to say October 1st um, and then I think you know when it come mid next month they'll probably re-examine it and see if it needs to be extended again. Um, just the way the legislature works in the short term because of their you know inability to hold hearings or uh, hold the governor to account on some of these issues um that's probably the right move to but but also in the long term you need uh dual branch checks and balances on each other and make sure that the governor is actually doing it correctly thank you are there other questions for Jared? So let me ask one if there's not one from the general audience. Um, let me ask in general about cross town cooperation because I think at the state senate uh, is the state senator is the appropriate place to do a lot of cross town cooperation, which I don't really think we've had a lot of. You know, with Braintree, for example, we have a joint reservoir the joint water issues, we discussed that actually a bit and you can bring that up, but I'm actually concerned also about the reservoir walk, we call it in Randolph, that would go into Braintree as well. Um, there's also issues with Blue Hills in effect, Milton and Canton and, Numer and Braintree and several other towns where we really need some cross town cooperation. And my pet issue on that is about grant uh, writing where, where we could as a series of towns apply for grants primarily through the uh, MAPC, the Metropolitan Area Planning Commission, which we haven't done. So uh, what I'm looking for is, 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 you mentioned the word comprehensive, that's what sparked this, about a comprehensive method to work among the towns in, in your district um, to get some things done at the state or regional level, let's call it. Yeah. What, what do you think? Uh, well, I would definitely be into it in terms of trying to come up with a system and a, and a way to try to make that happen and really help the, uh, the boards of selectmen, particularly. Um, and it, Randolph is obviously a, a town council, but most of the rest of the 10 towns in the district are boards of selectmen. Um, we would definitely need their buy-in, of course, because they're ultimately the people who are applying for the grants, but we can, my office can try to be an organizing factor in that type of effort, right? Where uh, we can try to help put it together um, as long as we have, you know, local buy-in for that they actually want to do that. Uh, you know, some of the towns have much more um, uh, competition going on with each other, both um, financially and historically and spiritually than some of the others. Um, and, but I think that, that having more regional approaches to some issues, not all, some, is, uh, is in everyone's benefit. So being a collaborating and then kind of organizing factor, I think would be helpful. Yes, that's what I mean, is that we, we, we could, in theory, use the State Senate office as a way to collaborate with other towns. Um, you know, the MAPC grants, I think, are a great program, but basically we don't partake of them. I don't know if Braintree does any of those, Kathy, but uh, uh, I know that we don't, and, and I think that we could and, and should, and we need a, a venue <laughs> to get that cooperation going. Ranger needs some improvement as far as its grant writing goes. That was one of the issues in the mayoral election in 2019 was that we lost out on uh, grants for parks and um, things because we didn't we didn't have the necessary uh, structures in place to even apply for those grants. Right. And what do you think, Jared, about using the state senate office to help with that? 
Yeah, I mean, I think that using the state senate office as kind of an organizing factor and trying to be like a collaborative approach, I think is appropriate. I don't want to be in the position, to be honest, of trying to pit the towns to get against each other, right? Where um, I don't want to be in the dis the in the place where you know we're saying Braintree should not apply for this because Randolph needs this, right? Where we're trying to be more of the organization so that the town councils of both towns can kind of make that decision together, right? Um, and, uh, but I'm definitely open to it. Yeah. Great. Uh, Toby, I think you've got one more question, then we'll go to uh, a closing statement from Jared. And Toby, you have to unmute. Oh, you're unmuted. Good. You're good to go. Um, do you have any opinion how to fix the brown water issue from the water plants? That's the Holbrook, Braintree, Randolph, uh, Tritown treatment plant. Yes. Um, so I, well, so like I live in Stoneman, right? So coming at this from an outsider's perspective, right, where I did not, you know, inherently know about this until I started running for office. Um, so one of the things that I would need to do, to be honest, is to just investigate more about what is happening and how it's happening. Go to the plan itself and try to try to see what we can do. Um, my understanding is that is that a lot of the pipe network is is to blame for for a whole bunch of it, um, and that they have a whole, whole lot of the pipes need to be replaced. Uh, but I need to I need to learn more to be honest before I have a concrete answer for that. Um, yeah. Well, thank you. No problem. Okay, uh, I think uh, we should wrap up. And if you'd like to make a closing statement, that would be great. So you can bring up whatever issues we didn't get to bring up. And certainly, please plug your contact info and your website. So, uh, like I said, my name is Jared Rose. I am running for state senate. Uh, I am running because we have a real opportunity in this district to really have a real progressive vision. And we have some core central issues that are not being addressed. Housing, our environment, our transportation system, and then just transparency and honesty in government. You know, our state senator right now has been invited to at least 12 to 15 different events with me and has shown up to literally zero of them. Uh, I've shown up to all of them and tried to tell people what I believe in. That is something that we're not seeing right now. One of my commitments is to really have, try to be a state senator who tells you what we believe in and allow you to do the same thing. We might ultimately disagree, but that is a core function of democracy. So I invite you to check me out at jaredrose.com. That's J-A-R-R-E-D, rose like the flower, dot com. You can email me at Jared at jaredrose.com. You can find us on Facebook, Jared Rose for State Senate. I'm on Twitter and Instagram, Jared, the number four, M-A. And, you know, vote uh, in, vote by mail, vote early or vote in person on September 1st. And I hope that you will vote for Jared Rose. Let me close with the mechanics question on that, because I think a lot of people are unaware of how it works. I believe that uh, in-person voting started today. So could you uh, tell us what the rules are? I, I believe that the rules are you can in-person vote or request a mail ballot or actually go on September 1st. Uh, yes. That's for the Democratic primary. And yes. you have to request a Democratic ballot. Is that, did yes. I get that all right? Yes. So if you are a registered Democrat, you will automatically, you can only request the Democratic ballot. Same thing if you're a registered Republican, you only get a, a uh, Republican ballot. If you're unenrolled, you can request either one, but not both. Um, and you can do either mail, mail in voting if you request it ahead of time, or vote early in person at your town hall, um, which started today and will go to the 28th, or you can vote in person at the poll stations on September 1st. Great. And I believe that the mail-in voting 
each town has a, a box. I know that Randolph does. I, I think every other town does. Every town does. So you don't have to actually spend a stamp. You could simply drop it off at the last minute, for that matter, um, yes. in the box at your town hall. Is that right in every town? Yes. They, yes, exactly. And um, in fact, the secretary, the secretary of state is is kind of urging people to do exactly that if, if they take the time to actually go drop off their ballot uh, during this next week and a half. Um, that way, you don't have any problems with uh, you know Trump shenanigans with the USPS. That's what I was thinking of. Yes. <laughs> um, but you know, I think we're going to have really excellent turnout, right? We have really great candidates, uh, particularly one particularly good one for state Senate. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, our U.S. Senate race, uh, the district ha is mostly in Congressman Lynch's district, and we have that race between Congressman Lynch and Robbie, uh, Dr. Robbie. Um, we have a whole bunch of uh, state house races and uh, county races. So we're hoping for really high turnout, and I think that we'll see that. Um, and, you know, my name is right next to Ed Markey and Joe Kennedy's. Um, so make sure that you just look slightly to the right <laughs> when you're voting there, and you will see Jared Phillip Rose. And I hope you fill in that circle. Thank you okay. so much. And I'm going to plug our last debate in our Zoomathon coming up. Um, it is on braintreedems.org in order to uh, slash events. In order to look for it, it is the Norfolk County Treasurer uh, event. And uh, also, uh, Kathy, you posted trackmyballotma.com. You're going to have to say what it is. I'm not too sure what it is. Something about tracking your ballot in state, I guess. OK, so once you, for that. once you mail in your ballot, or if you drop it in the ballot box, or even if you go to the polls, you can use this uh, track my ballot uh, mass uh, site. It's on the Secretary of State's. Uh, it'll it'll link you to the Secretary of State's website, and it will tell you whether your ballot has been received and whether it has been accepted. So I mailed my ballot in right away. Um, I checked; it's been accepted, it's been received. I know that my vote has been counted. Great, thank you, Jared, for coming. Thank you so uh, thank much you for, for attending. Uh, we'll send you the post information so you can uh, send it around too, and we'll try Please to post do. it if we can.